Presbyterian Church. I'm the pastor here, the Reverend Emily Zeiglinzi. It is good to be together this morning, gathered here in the sanctuary. We do have a couple of folks joining us on Zoom this morning and folks who worship with us through our YouTube channel throughout the week. A couple of quick announcements. The spring rubbish sale is just three weeks away and signups are up out in the lobby for help sorting and organizing and then packing up when it is over. Um, so if you're able to help out, stop by and sign up, we would sure appreciate it. Uh, next Sunday starts Holy Week. Next Sunday is Palm Sunday and our ch children will be processing at the beginning of worship with palms and our choir will be back um, singing in worship as well. And then that Thursday, April 14th, is Monday Thursday. And I invite you to join us for a soup supper and a worship service, all taking place in the fellowship hall starting at 6 p.m. There is a sign-up sheet out in the lobby for that as well, just so we have a ballpark figure as we prepare and set up the fellowship hall. Even if you don't sign up and you're free, you're welcome to come. But if you know you're coming, that helps us be able to set up the fellowship hall. And then finally, Easter Sunday is only two Sundays away. We'll be having a free breakfast for everyone at 9 a.m., the children's Easter egg hunt at 10 a.m., and of course, worship with special choir music at 10.30 a.m. Uh, and then also related to Easter, Easter flower orders on this bright greenish yellow form are due next Sunday. Uh, please read through your bulletin because there's lots of other stuff happening and lots of other notes about those items as well. And now as God's beloved community, let us stand and greet one another this morning. As you find your way back to your seats, let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship as we pause for the ringing of the bell and to listen to a prelude by Joan.
Would you please stand as you're able for the call to worship? For everything, there is a season. There is a time for learning and growing. There is a time for weeping and sadness. There's a time for work and school. Now is a time for worship. Our opening hymn is number four, How Great Thou Art. Let us join our voices together in song. You may be seated. 
It is a myth that God holds our foolish acts and harsh words against us. The truth is, in the cross of Christ, God forgives us for our sins and offers us grace. So trusting in this truth, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Would you please join me in the unison prayer of confession? Lord, we confess that we want to make sense of our lives and the world. We guess at reasons terrible things happen. We explain tragedies by focusing on their teachings. Forgive us, Lord. Remind us that your ways are not our ways and your thoughts are not our thoughts. Let it also sink in that your desire is for our greatest good and never to harm us. Amen. This is the truth. Hear the good news. In Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and coming again, we are forgiven and set free to live in faithfulness with God and one another. Thanks be to God. And now let us welcome the children forward for the children's time by singing Where Children Belong. Good morning. One of our scripture readings this morning comes from a book called Ecclesiastes. That's kind of a difficult name for a book of the Bible. Ecclesiastes. Do you think you can say it? Ecclesiastes. All right. And that scripture reading is going to talk about all sorts of different times in our lives. Okay. And so I'm going to read part of the scripture reading from my children's Bible here. It says, there is a time for everything, a time for you to make new things and a time to tear things down, a time for you to welcome and a time to say goodbye. There's a time to get ready and a time to stop. There's a time when you are hurt and a time when you get better. There's a time to cry and a time to laugh. There's a time when you might be sad, and there's a time when you might dance for joy. There's a time to look for someone or something and a time to hide. There's a time to listen and a time to talk. There's a time to be angry and a time to love. Now I wonder, have you ever experienced any of those times I just talked about? Yeah, which one have you experienced before? A time to, when something bad happens or a time to be bad? Yeah, that happens sometimes. A time to get hurt. Yeah, sometimes we skin our knees when we're riding bikes or we fall down and scrape an elbow. We do have times that we get hurt. A time to love. Yeah. A time to be mad. Yeah, that happens sometimes. So I wonder if there's any others that we might add on here. How about a time to go to school? And then these kind of have opposites, you know, like a time to get hurt and a time to get better. So if we said there's a time to go to school, what might be the opposite of that one? A time to stay home or a time to play, a time for summer vacation. Let's see if we can think of any other ones. How about... A time to hug and a time when we might not feel like hugging someone else. So, and that's okay too. What else? A time to pray. Yeah, and then there's time in our days when we're not praying. Yeah, those are great ones, guys. Do you have another one? A time to go to church. Yeah, on Sundays we come to church. And then there's other days of the week when we're not at the church. Yeah, these are great. Any more? 
No? All right. You did a great job thinking of them. And in a minute, I'm going to read the scripture lesson, and it's going to list some more. So be listening, listening for those opposites, okay? Like a time to build and a time to tear down. That's the one, one of them we're going to hear. So be listening for those. They're going to happen in a minute here. But in all these different times, whether it's a time to be at church or a time not to be at church, whether it's a time to be at school or a time to be on summer vacation, whether it's a time to feel love or a time to feel sad or mad, in all those different times, God is with us. Because God is always with us. And that's what the writer is trying to tell the people. There's all these different times in our lives, but no matter what kind of time it is, God is always with us. Okay, can we say a prayer together? Dear God, thank you for all the different times in our lives and for always being with us. Amen. All right, today's a communion Sunday, so we're going to stay in worship so you can go back and sit in your pew. Let us pray. Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit, open our hearts to hear your word this morning. Stretch our minds to consider your teachings and learn something new today. Nudge us to lead more faithful lives. Amen. Our first scripture reading is the one from the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. Listen now for those times and those opposites as they come to us from the word of God. For everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to throw away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to sew, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. Our second scripture reading this morning is from the book of Genesis, chapter 37, verses 1 through 24, and chapter 50, verses 14 through 21. Siri and Sarah are coming forward this morning and helping with the scripture reading. Uh, Siri is going to be reading Joseph's words from the Genesis story, and Sarah is going to be all of the other characters in the story. So I invite you to listen again for the word of the Lord. This is the story of the family of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was shepherding the flock with his brothers. He was a helper to the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives, and Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his children because he was the son of his old age and he had made them a long robe with sleeves. 
But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his other brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Once Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, Listen to this dream that I dreamed. There we were, binding sheaves in the field. Suddenly, my sheep rose and stood upright. Then your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brothers said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us? Are you indeed to have dominion over us? So they hated him even more because of his words and his dreams. He had another dream, and Joseph told it to his brothers, saying, Look, I have had another dream. The sun, the moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What kind of dream is this that you have had? Shall we indeed come, I and your mother and your brothers, and bow to the ground before you? So his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem, and Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. He answered, Here I am. So he said to him, Go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring word back to me. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron. He came to Shechem, and a man found him wandering in the fields. The man asked him, What are you seeking? I am seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where they are pasturing the flock. The man said, They have gone away, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. They saw him from a distance, and before he came near to them, they conspired to kill him. They said to one another, Here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we shall say that a wild animal has devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he delivered him out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. Reuben said to them, Shed no blood. Throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but lay no hand on him. That he might rescue him out of their hand and restore him to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the long robe with sleeves that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. Now many years later, after he had buried his father, Joseph returned to Egypt with his brothers and all who had gone up with him to bury his father. Realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers said, What if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong that we did to him? So they approached Joseph, saying, Your father gave this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. Now therefore, please forgive the crime of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. And then his brothers also wept, fell down before him, and said, We are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good, in order to preserve a numerous people, as he is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. In this way, he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Kate.
Kate Bowler is a professor at Duke Divinity School with a modest Christian upbringing, but she specializes in the study of the prosperity gospel. Now, the prosperity gospel is a creed that sees fortune as a blessing from God and misfortune as a mark of God's disapproval. At age 35, everything in Kate's life seemed to point to blessing. She's thriving in her job as a seminary professor. She's married to her high school sweetheart, and she loves life with her newborn son. But then, in one whirlwind afternoon, she is diagnosed with stage four colon cancer. In her book, Everything Happens for a Reason and Other Lies I've Loved, Kate writes, my world of certainty had ended, and so many people seemed to know why. Most of their explanations were reassurances that even this is a secret plan to somehow improve me. God has a better plan, they would tell me. This is a test, and it will make you stronger. Each cliche thrown my way, an attempt to explain why God gave me stage four cancer. God often gets blamed for things God did not do. Words and sayings get attributed to God and Christianity when they actually have little to do with either one. That's what we've been exploring in this myth-busted, truth-revealed sermon series. Popular sayings that get tossed around. Many of them are sort of true. They're not completely false. They're true to a point or in the right light, or in the right context, but in reality, they don't quite cut it. Each week, we've busted the myth and discovered the truth. The truth is often longer than the catchy short myth, and therefore, the more complex, nuanced truth statement doesn't catch on in everyday life, but in reality, they more fully capture the love of God and the complexity of our faith. We've already busted, God does not care what happens to us. God never gives us more than we can handle. God helps those who help themselves, and I can do it on my own. Today, we tackle the cliche, everything happens for a reason. When Kate Bowler first heard the word cancer, murmur to her over the phone, all the big eternal questions just came rushing in. Why? Why is this happening to me? What could I have done differently? Does everything actually happen for a reason? Where is God? In the midst of pain and suffering, God gets blamed for all sorts of things. God gets blamed for natural disasters hurricanes, tornadoes, tsunamis. Insurance policies and legal documents call them an act of God, when in fact God is not up in heaven plotting and acting to devastate certain areas with natural disasters. In the same way, God is not behind tragedies, such as school shootings or 9-11 or the Holocaust. And yet God has been blamed for each one of those by various peoples and groups. The truth is we live in a broken and sinful world. On this side of heaven, bad things just happen sometimes. Are there stories of incredible good in the midst of natural disasters and tragedies? Yes. But just because God can work incredible good out of unspeakable tragedies, does not mean that God orchestrated those tragedies to happen in the first place. God does not send obstacles into our lives so we can learn lessons. We might learn lessons along the way, but God's not giving us bad stuff so we can learn lessons. 
God does not send death and destruction into the world so we can learn about God's love. That's just backwards. God can, however, be at work in the midst of painful situations. Take Joseph's story. Joseph is put through the ringer in life. One of the youngest of 12 brothers, Joseph is the favorite of his father, Jacob. Jacob spoils him and all the other brothers resent Joseph. And so they plot to get rid of him. The first plan is to leave him in a pit to die. We heard this part of the story in our scripture reading this morning. But the brothers change their minds moments later and decide to sell Joseph to some passing merchants who in turn sell him to the captain of the guard in Egypt. And the brothers lie to their father and tell him Joseph was killed by a wild animal. Joseph works his way up in the guard of Egypt, only to be sent to prison when he denies the advances of Pharaoh's wife. But in jail, he interprets some dreams and is eventually recruited to interpret Pharaoh's dream. In his dream interpretation, he impresses Pharaoh, and that lands him in charge of overseeing the country's food production. And so when famine hits, Joseph is prepared. His brothers are not. They travel to Egypt to beg for some food and end up in front of none other than their brother Joseph, whom they thought they would never see again. The brother that they sold into slavery will now decide where their next meal will come from. Things could have ended very badly for the brothers. But Joseph offers forgiveness and works toward reconciliation. We picked our scripture reading back up at the end of the story here, where Joseph says, Even though you intended to do me harm, God intended it for good. Joseph is reassuring his brothers that he won't retaliate for everything that he's been through. But Joseph is also telling us about the way that God works. His sentence didn't start with God. The subject of the first part of his sentence, we're just going to do a little English class this morning, the subject is the brothers. You those 11 devious brothers standing in front of him. They are the ones who started Joseph on his rough life journey. They are the ones who made the poor life choice to leave Joseph to die and then to sell him as a slave. It wasn't God who caused all that went wrong in Joseph's life. That was the brothers doing. It was God who worked through all that went wrong to bring about some right. So when we say that everything happens for a reason, somehow implying that God is behind it all, we're placing God at the wrong part of the story. God doesn't belong at the beginning, causing the horrible things to happen that lead us to spout this cliché. God isn't causing loss of job or cancer or death of a loved one. It's a myth because God doesn't intend harm for us. The truth is that bad things just happen sometimes in our world. Even though God did not cause them to happen, God can still work through the situation. So this more nuanced truth places God a little later in the story, not at the beginning causing it all. God is in the middle of the story with us through whatever is happening, with Joseph as he is thrown in jail, with Kate as she faced surgery and cancer treatment, with families as they grieve a death of a loved one, whatever tough situation they're in the middle of. And God is at the end of the story, sometimes helping some good to come out of it, like Joseph being in charge of food production and storage and able to help his family through the time of famine. 
That is the God we come to know in the Bible, the one who can work in the midst of bad situations. That is the God we serve, the one who, if there is any good to be found, God will find it. And that is the God we worship, the one who does not intend to harm us, but wants the best for us. That is the God I believe in. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our hymn of response is hymn number 52, O God, Our Health in Ages Past. Would you please stand and let us join our voices together in song. You may be seated. As we prepare to celebrate communion together, know that even though we celebrate in different places, we are yet connected through this meal and through Christ. If you are at home, you may eat your bread and drink your juice in the way that works for you, whether that's dipping bread into juice or eating each one separately. In the sanctuary this morning, the elders will be passing trays with bread and juice. On your tray of bread today is home-baked bread from our deacons that are individually um, in Ziploc bags. So you'll be able to take a piece, um, each person as it passes by, and know that it's sanitary. And then as the plates of juice are passed, you can pick from either an open grape juice cup or one of the pre-packaged cups, and you can lift it up and just take the juice that way. This is not my table. This is not the church's table. This is Christ's table and Christ welcomes all here. You don't need to be having a particularly good day to be welcome here. It's okay if you're having a bad day. Christ says you are welcome here. You don't have to have a really strong faith before you can come to this table. Christ says, it's okay if you have questions and doubts. This meal is for you, too. You don't need to know everything in the Bible, thank goodness, before we come to this table. Christ says, you are welcome here if you are still learning and growing in your faith. Christ says, this is my table, and it is open to all. So please hear that invitation and know that you are welcome here today. 
Let us pray. Holy God, it is good and right that we offer you our thanks and praise. For in that first moment of creation, you cried out for the created world to go and grow. And flowers grew in the cracks of chaos, and animals ran through the newly formed meadows. Your hand came upon the dry dust of earth, and your spirit breathed life into us. You longed for us to be with you, but we allowed sin and death to lead us. You called to women and men to prophesy and call us back, but we did not believe their words. So you sent a certain man named Jesus to help us and to cause new life to come upon us. Seeing that those he loved were sick, he helped and brought us healing. Finding us wandering in despair, he helped and showed us that our hope need never turn to dust. Believing that you loved him, he went to the cross for us. And when he was in the tomb, you called out for resurrection and new life, and he rose again, helping us to have eternal life as well. Believing that he is the one who helps us, we come to this table to be fed. We lift up the bread and the cup to you and ask that the bread we break and the cup we bless become to us the body and blood of Christ. And the bread and the cup give us new life and new hope that we may believe again that God helps us and God is with us. It is in Christ's name that we pray using the words that he taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, took bread. And after giving thanks to God for it, he broke it and said, Take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then in the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And he said, This cup is a new covenant. It's sealed in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Every time you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. And so every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we remember Jesus Christ until he comes again. We are serving communion this morning by passing trays through the pews. And so the elders will start by passing the trays of bread through the pews, and you'll take a baggie and hold on to it. And once all have been served, I will cue that we will eat. And then later on, the same with the juice, drink together. Just a little reminder, because it's been a while since we've done it this way.
This is the cup of salvation. Let us pray. God, thank you for feeding us in this meal and reminding us of your presence with us always, even when bad things happen. Help us to go out into the world ready to lean on you for strength as we handle together each day. Amen. It is a myth that we can't do anything to change the world. The truth is we can. And when we give to God and the church, we participate in God's transforming work in the world. And we don't do that alone. Our offerings are combined to make a larger impact. So each and every offering is vital to the support of the mission and ministry that we do as a church. So thank you for giving this morning. We also teach our children about giving through the offering that they collect during Sunday school. The first few months of the year, the Sunday school offering was collected for the Heifer Project, an organization that helps end hunger and poverty in a sustainable way through supporting and investing alongside farmers and their communities. The Sunday school classes collected $200 and the kids voted on which animals to purchase with their money. With their $200, the kids voted to purchase a goat, rabbits, chickens, and honeybees. The goat will help families in some of the world's poorest places, because did you know that goat's milk is more nutrient dense than cow's milk? The rabbits are easy to care for and reproduce quickly, so the owners can sell their offspring for extra income. The chickens lay eggs that the families can then use in their kitchens, 
and the chickens also provide manure for the vegetable gardens and honeybees produce honey for these families. And so what wonderful gifts our children were able to purchase and send out to those in need. Love is taught and it grows here and we share it with others.
Let us pray. You, Lord, are our God, and we are your people. As you have placed your generosity in our hearts, we pray now for the blessing of pouring it out for others. May the gifts we bring be of use in your kingdom, bringing hope to the despairing, light in the valley of shadows, peace in the midst of chaos. Make these tokens of our gratitude into a sign that shows your glory and to all come to see your gracious love. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 186, The Old Rugged Cross. Let us join our voices together in song. The cross was intended to do harm, to kill the very worst criminals. God intended it for good, 
to bring about our salvation. And so the idea that everything happens for a reason is complicated. The truth is that bad things just happen sometimes in our lives. And even though God didn't cause them, God is still with us and God can still work through those things. And now may the God who loves you take delight in your living. May the God who seeks you find you when you fall. And may the God who sends you send you now with great joy. For the very one who created you and redeemed you does go with you still. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us in worship today.